let, let me quickly set the stage for the webinar. Um, we're going to have a very interactive and lively conversation. We've got uh, great insights on the panel today, but I just want to quickly give you guys a, an overview of the sector. So the, at Clean Edge, and I wrote a piece on this recently that some of you may have seen, we see three major shifts in clean energy investing. Um, you know, if you look back five to ten years ago, clean energy finance was primarily the domain of venture capital investments and government R&D. Today we're seeing the explosive growth in many ways of corporate and institutional investing, so we'll talk a bit about that. We've also seen the rise of project finance, enabling the build out of renewables deployment across the globe from the U.S. to China to Germany. Uh, 2013, for example, marked a record year for solar with 36.5 gigawatts installed globally, uh, a record year, as I mentioned, uh, more than was actually installed in terms of gigawatts of wind. And 2014 is on track to reach 50 gigawatts of new global solar installation by year's end. So this incredible rise in project finance. And the other big shift we're seeing is the advent of new investment vehicles for retail investors, as I mentioned earlier, ranging from trade, uh, exchange traded funds and real estate investment trusts to yield co's and green bonds. Um, one look, need look no further than the news headlines uh, to get an idea of the range of activity and its impact on investors. In the past year and a half, we've seen the introduction of more than a half dozen yield co's focused on the deployment of renewables, many from established energy players. We've also seen nearly a dozen clean energy focus exchange traded funds launched in the past half decade. And more recently, which we'll address today, we've seen the advent of things like solar bonds. The influx of capital has been considerable into these new vehicles. For ETFs, assets under management stand at more than 600 million collectively among the three leading ETFs in the sector. The solar focused Guggenheim's TAN at 337 million, the clean energy focus PBW from PowerShares at 159 million, and QClean from First Trust at 109 million, which is a fund based on Clean Edge's sales index. Green bonds for institutional investors have increased dramatically in recent years, up from less than 1 billion in new issues in 2007 to 11 billion last year. In the first eight months of this year alone, the sum is closer to 30 billion, more than twice as much as in. Uh, 2013 as a whole. And yield co's are attracting significant capital as well, with NRG yields NYLD market cap currently at around $1.6 billion, Sun Edison's Terraform's Power, TERP, at $792 million. This morning they announced the acquisition of First Wind, and Next Era Energy Partners, NEP, at around $650 million. Um, let me just talk a little bit about uh, the Solar City Solar Bond, and then we'll go into this in depth with, with Tim and others. Uh, Solar City Solar Bonds are another example of some of the new types of retail investment offerings that we'll be talking about today. Solar bonds, for example, can offer up to seven or four, excuse me, four percent returns over a seven-year term, which compare very favorably when looking at other savings and fixed income investment options such as CDs and Treasury notes. Uh, before we jump into our moderated conversation, I want to remind you all again to please type in your questions in the question field, and then I'll be getting those handed over to me uh, from Bryce, and we'll get into all your questions as well. Um, Nancy, I I'd like to start with you. Um, you've been at the forefront of investing in clean energy uh, with investments in Tesla, uh, SolarCity, PowerLite, BrightSource, and many others. What can you tell us about the investment space for clean energy today compared with five years ago? And what would you say are the biggest changes and how does that impact retail investors? So over to you, Nancy. Well, thank you, Ron, and, and, and uh, thanks to the team for pulling together this very timely webinar. And I think you've set the stage for, for my answer with, with your uh, charts that you just reviewed with us because the, the big difference between now and five years ago for retail investors is that there's choice. There's um, there's a growing number of options, both in terms of asset classes and companies out there and technologies to back. And so back when we were 
you know, investing in power lights and solar city and such, there really wasn't much out there. And, and, and so venture capital was, um, you know, one of the only games in town if you wanted to kind of go big in, in solar. Um, because when you're a retail investor, when you're any investor, you want to have choice. You want to have a portfolio approach so that you can kind of capture all the various movements in in a space and, and not just be uh, tied to one stock or one bond or uh, just one one anything. And so, and that really wasn't doable. I mean, of course, there were some names out there, but uh, it wasn't possible to build a portfolio uh, with with kind of hedging and risk risk distribution and sector distribution. And the good news is that today for the retail investor, we are moving so that uh, there there's choice, there's opportunity, and, and there there is that ability to build a portfolio. You can buy a bunch of solar stocks. You can do, as you point out, you can do solar bonds. You can do yield co's. Uh, you know, even today, you know, we, we, the well-timed, you know, who, whoever believed that you could buy a public stock that was doing both solar and wind at the first time? Well, you know, with, with Sun Edison's announcement yesterday buying first wind, now you can do that. So um, the choices are really lining up in a, in a very nice way so that um, retail investors can jump in uh, at all different risk levels and at the same time you know all the good news for our sector is that with these um, increasingly uh, you know democratized access to, to financing renewables uh, it's helping to drive down the cost in our industry and so it's a virtuous circle uh, where you know more people come in and things get even better and cheaper and that will bring in the next wave of investors great well that's a great segue over to Tim and Tim solar city's recent launch of solar bonds opens up a new investment opportunity for a range of retail investors as I mentioned earlier offering up to four percent returns with potentially less risk and volatility than individual securities, more on sort of a fixed income uh, savings type account. What, what did Source, why did Solar City develop this new vehicle and, and what type of investors do you expect to attract? One, well, thank you. And, and like Nancy, I wanted to thank you for pulling together this webinar. Um, I, I want to step back for a moment and, and answer that question and, and look at where we are. Whenever you have a disruptive technology, there's a massive investment opportunity. And if you think of what happened in the shift from mainframes to PCs, from landlines to cell phones, or from traditional media to the Internet, these were disruptive technologies that were changing large markets. And, and as I said, there were massive investment opportunities. Now look at the, invest, the, the, sorry, now look at the energy industry, which is a trillion-dollar market. We're seeing an acceleration in the shift from fossil fuels to renewables from, and from centralized power production to more local power production. Rooftop solar is a disruptive force in this transformation. Large institutional investors are taking advantage of this opportunity and are investing. At Solar City Run, we've created funds to finance more than $5 billion in solar systems with institutional and corporate investors that range from Goldman Sachs to Google. Um, but there really has not been an opportunity for individuals to participate in, in, in that kind of financing. And so what we wanted to do was open the door for everyone to participate. And, and when we said everyone, what, what, what we meant was all U.S. investors. And so we've launched the nation's first public offering of solar bonds that are available to essentially everyone. And you need to be 18 years old, have a U.S. bank account, and, um, and, and you can invest. Um, the, the, the range of, of investors that are participating uh, um, include both individuals who have $1,000 to put to work and are looking for a good savings vehicle to that, to investors with, with a great deal more money to put to work and are looking for an investment, investment opportunity. And that's what we wanted to be able to try. Great, and we'll be talking a bit more about it. And, and just to point out, I mean, really, Solar City, more than any other organization, really began securitizing solar assets. So that ability to attract a corporate and institutional and now to expand out to retail investors is, is quite notable. Let, let's move on to, to, to Amy um, Davidson. Amy, 
you, you head up the North American arm of a major climate NGO, I believe with the, your headquarters in the UK, and, and you have your own roots in the financial industry. F from an impact investing perspective, how important is the advent of all these new retail investment vehicles that we're seeing uh, on the investment landscape? Yeah, th thanks, Ron. Um, I think that's absolutely critical, and I, I would like to sort of put it in context for the impact perspective, like where we are with global warming. I mean, global warming impacts are here. We're seeing the sea level rise in Miami already and droughts in California and a number of impacts around the globe. And we know that if we want to avoid the most dangerous and irreversible impacts of global warming, we need to limit global average temperatures to below 2 degrees Celsius or reduce greenhouse gas emissions by about 80% by 2050 and head to zero emissions by the end of the century. And clearly we're not on that path. We're really actually heading to 4 to 6 degrees warming by the end of the century, which, you know, according to climate scientists, that's actually, you know, incompatible with organized human civilization. So clearly we want to do everything we can to avoid this future and that's exactly what the climate group is doing is to accelerate these markets by working with businesses so the clean energy solutions that are out there we need to scale the markets at just a radical radical pace to move away from fossil fuels to cleaner healthier solutions so that's sort of the context of where we are we've seen ron as you just pointed out right that there's been tremendous growth in these energy markets but we are very far from the scale we need so much greater investment is required. I think the IEA was estimating it's about a trillion dollars a year of investment that's needed on a global basis, or about triple global investments today. Today, yeah. Uh, yeah, and, um, and, yeah, and NEF has been tracking that as well. So, so we really yeah. need to scale this up. So, uh, it, it, go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. So anything. So it's really moving away from governments to moving government as a solution to unlocking really sort of the innovative financial solutions, which absolutely, I think these investment vehicles that have been out in the market recently for retail investments are, are key because it's opening a completely new market to scale these solutions much faster. So I really applaud Solar City on the solar bond in particular. Cause I think well, I'd, I'd like to open up to everyone. I mean, Amy, you started to cover this already, talking about some of the macro trends. Um, but, but I'd like to open it up to, to Tim and, and to Nancy as well. So what are the big macro trends that are driving investments in clean energy today? Climate's been mentioned, perhaps cost, renewable energy targets, others. Um, Nancy, could you start off and share some of your thoughts about what's really driving the thesis here? Sure. Um, happy to. And, and I'll just uh, – there are lots of reasons, but I'll focus on two. Sure. And uh, one has to do with what – uh, Tim just alluded to that that uh, migration from the mainframe to the um, the tablet that we have today, and we've all lived through that. Um, as investors, um, that's a very important. Tr uh, those transitions, those innovation cycles, if you will, are always great places to invest. And so, what's what's different this time? Is, is that for kind of 100 years, it's been your grandfather's electricity industry and hasn't really changed much. And, uh, but now there's an innovation cycle, just like there, was, there has been in computers and radio and phones. There's an innovation cycle going on in energy, uh, in clean energy especially. And, and so that is driving a lot of the interest because people know they've, they've made money you know, going from mainframes to tablets or from terrestrial radio to internet radio, on and on and on. They, they know and, and they see some of the same trends associated in energy uh, that they've seen in, in these other sectors. I mean, personalization, consumer choice. Whoever talked about that in energy, you know, even five years ago? Well, you talk about it in radio, you talk about it in computing, now you're starting to talk about it in energy and, and solar and storage and all the great innovations that we've been working on for all these years are the, way to, are, are the way to make that happen. And so people are just kind of saying, hey, I've made money um, chain, uh, investing across these innovation cycles in other, other areas, um, so why wouldn't I do that in energy when it's, I don't know, what is it, 18, 19 percent of the GDP? I mean, it's a huge industry, let's face it. So that's the first trend. The second trend is um, the rise of impact investing. 
and, and that is, that's what DBL has been doing for, for 10 years, and we've been fortunate to grow with, with the field, and it used to not be that popular. Now it is, it is just sizzling hot. I mean, and, and, and impact investing, really my, my kind of tag long, tagline for what it is, it's where value meets value. Basically, impact investing it allows you to invest in innovation that's going to make great returns, but not sacrifice your values and indeed support, enhance your values by the choices you make uh, as an investor so that you can, you can address these, these terrible problems we have with climate change, as Amy described, and create solutions, create a positive narrative uh, at the same time that you are being a responsible investor and a successful investor. And so after years and years of, of people thinking that you, sh you shouldn't mix social agendas with investing, uh, now it's actually been turned upside down. Millennials, of course, are driving a lot of it, but it's way more than a millennials trend. It is a, a trend that has broad-based demographic support and is here to stay. Is there a bit of a risk mitigation, risk reduction, in fact, by going that pathway? Well, sure, because you, you know, the, the whole um, scenario for coal and, and other fossils uh, is, is in many ways against, uh, you know, not only is it, does it have negative implications for the planet, as Amy described, but it all, you know, those industries have some pretty troubling aspects to them in terms of investment. And, and you look at, for example, the number of bankruptcies in the coal industry over the mm. past several years. So, so getting jumping aboard the clean energy train with all of the you know bonds and 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 equities and you know kind of the the growing number of ways you can play it is is in, indeed a very appropriate risk mitigation in in the energy field excellent um, Tim do you have some other macro trends to share well I wanted to pick up where where Nancy was going with this which is talking about the innovation cycle Sure. And um, in in the case specifically of solar, um, what you're seeing is 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 two real trends coming together around innovation, and one is is familiar to probably everyone on this uh, webinar, which is the the cost of solar has come down so dramatically over the past five years that that what was once a, a, an expensive alternative is is now for many homeowners the more economic alternative and when when solar city was was started it was it was started with, with one very simple idea which is if you want to deploy solar at scale to consumers that you need to save them money rather than cost them money and the and those reductions of costs mean that in more and more states around the country, it's now possible for consumers to choose choose locally generated power on their rooftops as a more economical option than than their their traditional um, power choices. And you're seeing that trend, which is a massive trend, um, combined with something else, which is very very interesting in this case, which is the the some of the changes in the financial sector because what's driving especially distributed generation is as much financial innovation as it is the technology innovation and so you're seeing the ability of people to to have multiple kinds of long-term contracts such as power purchase agreements or or solar leases and more recently you have loans um, who are, which are stepping up to take the place, which allow people to to acquire solar power and do it essentially the same way that they would get they would get traditional power, which is they're just paying their their monthly utility bill essentially in this. And and the same thing in in investing that you're seeing, which is which is across a whole variety of sectors that range from student loans to real estate and and now renewable energy you are seeing the ability of, of individuals using technology platforms to invest directly in opportunities that previously would have been either limited only to large institutional investors or only would have been offered through large financial institutions. And that means that the individuals are both getting access to more opportunities, but importantly, they're getting access to those opportunities at the preferential rates that that, that typically would have been available only to institutions. 
and and so with with opportunities like solar bonds, which we're offering, and other opportunities, it gives individuals a choice that is enabled by the technology-driven innovations in the financial industry. Um, excellent. And, and Amy, um, I know you talked a little bit about climate. Were there any other macro trends you wanted to cover before we move on from this question? Well, I just think one other thing, just building on what Nancy and Tim were just saying, it was about the choice. It's really also this, this sort of deep-rooted need for independence, whether it's at the, you know, the household level, that people want to control their, their energy. Um, so I think having sort of a rooftop solar solution uh, concept is very attractive to folks, and I think that's one of the, the, the reasons why it's, it's growing at the pace that it is. Excellent. Um, it's, Tim, um, again, we're going to be talking about a lot of other uh, opportunities and options, but I'd like you to walk us through how solar bonds work. Um, how are they structured, and how does the money flow into solar city projects? It's, it's pretty simple. Solar bonds are corporate bonds that are issued and backed by solar city, and the earnings on those bonds are paid by the solar payments that we received based on thousands of our customers around the country. And essentially, the investors are getting paid by the sun. And the, the bonds are available in terms ranging from one year up to seven years, and interest rates up to 4%, which, which again, as is, is Ron, you said, are, are relatively attractive compared to comparable investment opportunities that, that investors have. Um, one of the things that we did differently this time is, is rather than offering the bonds to the tr traditional um, uh, channels is that we launched our own online investment platform. You can just go to solarcity.com and choose invest and it's easy to set up an account, transfer funds and begin investing. And it, it allows individuals to participate in this opportunity in the same way that they are that they are making other choices about financial products that they may want. The, the funds from the bonds go to support our solar operation and installing more solar around the country. That's really all we do is, is is install solar systems and so the the investments here are to support the expansion of that opportunity and to 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 hire people to to deploy the solar panels around the country and then begin the cycle all over again and, and tim i know it's a bit early in the process and i'm not sure what you can share but could you tell us a little bit more about the the type of individuals you're attracting and then the type of investments you might expect to see over the next year or so? Sure. So, so we're seeing um, investments ranging from, from the, the minimum investments necessary, people who are using this essentially as a savings account um, to, to put some money into, into bonds and put it away, to, to individuals who are putting hundreds of thousands of dollars to work. And, and we've had thousands of people come sign up on the site. They've invested millions of dollars. And just in the, in the few short weeks we've been open. And we have um, customers registered on the site from, I think now we're at, at 48 states in the District hmm. of Columbia. So, it, 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 and that's an important point, which is, which is right now we offer solar in 15 states in the District of Columbia. Um, which is which is the the largest footprint of any solar provider. However, there's all there's a lot of people who because they don't live in a state where solar is offered, or they may not own a home, they may live in an apartment building, or their rooftop may be may not be right. There's a lot of people who who would like to participate in solar who can't, and this offers a much broader range of people the ability to participate and. And while they may not be able to save money on solar, now they can earn money on solar. Excellent. Thank you. Um, I, I want to go political just for a second. Um, you know, we've always said at Clean Edge that all energy is local. Uh, we can talk about that right now. Obviously, the midterm elections weren't kind to Democrats um, and put the Republicans in control of both the House and the Senate. We're going to see perhaps a Keystone XL, maybe it's happening right now, vote in the Senate. Um, what impact is this likely to have on clean energy sector in the U.S., and how might it change the equation, if at all, in, in terms of uh, opportunities moving forward? I'll open it up to the, the panelists. Well, well I, I'll, I'll go ahead and start, Ron, or, okay. unless, Nancy, you want to go ahead? No, 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 no go ahead. Yeah. So I was going to say that, that um, I, I think it's tempting to, 
to to look at this as a Democrat versus Republican and something that hinges on election. The, the reality is that that's not the case, and that in in the build out of the renewable energy markets today, and particularly of solar right now, it really is more about the capital markets and less about the political markets. Um, it, it is we reached the point where 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 investing in and deploying solar makes sense on strictly economic terms, and and those are the main drivers. Now, um, energy is a regulated industry. It is everywhere, and renewable energy is particularly policy driven. And anytime you're 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 building energy projects, that is inherently going to be a somewhat of a political process. That, that is always the way it is with energy infrastructure, and that that will remain. Um, I, I don't think that that it is. It's certainly not obvious to me that the result of the election will be will will be a shift that is negative um, for the deployment of solar renewables. For instance, um, one of the one of the, the benefits the, the, that has been an important benefit um, that has helped the industry is the investment tax credit. And there's a lot of discussion about whether that investment tax credit will change or not. Um, I, I think with with the the debate going on right now about whether or not we're going to have tax reform, that once you throw tax reform on the table, it's, it's not at all obvious to me how this is going to come out. Um, you know, we're, we're planning for changes, but, but I think we may see something that's quite different than people expect. Gotcha. You well, think? five years ago, it was not so partisan, so maybe we'll get back to those days. Um, Nancy, why don't you chime in? I know you were going to say something. Well, I would just um, add to what Tim has said, you know, this we know that the state's rule, um, you know, in terms of solar policy, not a, you know, obviously the ITC is a huge driver, and uh, I agree. I mean, it's a whole new ball game from 2008 when we extended the ITC, and and you know that last minute dash <laughs> we all remember, you know, because now we're huge. I mean, we still have a long ways to, to go before we're you know a household name. But we, the, the penetration of renewables in this country since 2008, in part because of the ITC and the PTC, uh, has made us um, very, very important, at, at, you know, state by state in terms of job creation, in terms of, um, you know, cheap energy uh, availability. And so we're no longer the, you know, the little kid that is, is, is trying to act big. You know, we are a force to be reckoned with, and we're a positive force. You know, in, in California, someone told me last week, there are more solar workers than there are utility workers. So, right. you know, we're, we're definitely uh, in a much more significant place this time around. And so what happened a few Tuesdays ago is, is really is not going to move the needle. What moves the needle is the, the cheap uh, clean energy, uh, the, the availability to, as we're talking today, to, to ordinary citizens to both um, use clean energy and invest in clean energy. And that, you know, uh, there's no doubt in, in, in my mind that, you know, Americans heart solar and, and it doesn't matter whether they're in the red, blue, or purple state. Well, and, 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 and just to point out, I mean, 36 percent uh, 36 percent voter turnout is not completely really a mandate and on a lot of the other questions that were asked and, and initiatives uh, a lot of different things got passed so but let's move on from the political and and I wanted in a lot of ways uh, we're seeing this sort of the democratization of, of clean energy uh, oh and by the way we're starting to get great questions in so keep those coming please um, and I'm going to move over to those in a moment um, but but I want to talk a little bit about crowdfunding um, I had Lyndon on a panel at Globe earlier uh, this year, uh, and, and he sort of saw the value and talked a little bit about crowdfunding. I'm just wondering, is crowdfunding in the panelists' view a viable pathway forward? Mosaic has been doing it. Do we think we can raise significant amounts of capital through crowdfunding, and how do you view crowdfunding? Maybe, Tim, why don't we start with you and then go on to the others? Well, Ron, we have certainly voted with our feet at Solar City. I mean, we over the coming years will 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 raise and deploy tens of billions of dollars of capital as we expand into this market, and and we expect that 
that a very large amount of that, we, if not a majority over time, that that we will um, that we will source from from what some may call crowdfunding, but we really look at it as opening the door to all of the other investors who have not been able to participate. And if, if is what we're doing crowdfunding, you know, we're not doing crowdfunding as is defined in the right. as it was defined in the Jobs Act. Right. Um, it, that is, in, it's interesting. It's going to be a very useful thing for some people. It's just too limited in scale for what for what we need to do. But if you define crowdfunding as allowing individual investors and smaller institutional investors to participate in investments that previously have been limited only to to large institutions or only offered through large financial institutions, then 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 what we're betting on is crowdfunding at a very large scale. Uh, Nancy, from your vantage point, and Amy as well, uh, anything around the power of crowdfunding? Well, you know, obviously crowdfunding is is one of the themes of our age, and, and, uh, generally, and, and you know, as venture capitalists, we we see it impacting a lot of what we do. And you know, it, again, I will say that um, clean tech investing, impact investing, is a big tent. You know, while while what Solar City is offering is you know much more buttoned up than kind of the Jobs Act crowdfunding model, and and and, and for good reason. I mean, there you know that's that's I think there's a large market for. For the quality of the offering that Solar City has, you know, there there are there are a lot of people out there that are you know have different risk tolerances or or um, you know just gravitate to different approaches, and so uh, and and there's no stopping that. I mean, you, you know, you're not going to you know, the success of Kickstarter and all of these 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 um, crowd funding organizations in other fields, there's no reason why you won't see those opportunities in, in this one because it's, you know, as I meant as we've all been mentioning, this resonates um, with mission and mission related investors yep. who are also quite interested in, in crowdsourcing. But you know, I well, do think Ron, it's Ron, I, Sorry. Yeah, Ron, I wanted, just wanted to add that that we have a tendency to look at whatever's happening now as as something that is that is a bright new shiny penny that has just landed in front of us. And, and the fact is, is that what we're calling crowdfunding now really is the 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 extension of some trends in the financial market that have really been going on for for 15 years or more, um, which is the which is the transformation of those markets driven by technology um, and the 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 increasing. Um, transparency of those markets and the increasing access to those markets that are being provided. And and 15 years ago, it was it was the the ability of individual investors to 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 participate in IPOs for the first time directly. Um, and you you've seen it march through different products. And right now, a lot of the focus is on credit products, and in particular. And so so. If it, out here in Silicon Valley, if you if you take a drive through, uh, just on a, on every other block block almost, you, what you're seeing are new companies that are starting up to disrupt the credit markets and to offer people the ability to invest directly in credit opportunities, whether they be in resources or real estate or in again student loans or or person to person lending, whatever it may be. This is the this is the the we're just we just have reached this stage of what has been a wave that has been building for 15 years. No, it's it's such a great point, and and if you look at, as well things like the REITs and and the yield codes, and if we get master limited partnerships opened up, not just to natural gas but also to renewables. So th there's certainly a, a, a significant shift. I, I'd like to move. We're starting to get great questions. I've got they're just pouring in. So let me go to a question that just came up, and, and Amy, I'd like to direct this to you first. Um, so, so the question, I'll, I'll try to paraphrase, but what's your realistic and practical path to scaling up these innovations and financial schemes? And, and the reason I wanted to direct this to you, Amy, the, the question has a counterpart to it, which is, and how can we make sure that there is actual carbon reduction impacts occurring through these financial uh, opportunities? So, so Amy, uh, why don't you take a stab at that? 
Sure. I just wanted to touch on one thing that, you know, Tim was saying before on, on the crowdfunding. I think it's really important that this is, you know, participatory and that new folks are able to enter into the market and invest in solar in particular um, as a way, because I do think that's going to have a side political uh, impact um, because you have, if, if Tim's already in 49 states, you're going to have 59 uh, states covered with investors and hopefully that'll grow and grow, then you're going to have more support for supporting the, the policies that are necessary to get us to um, this transition to a clean energy future. Um, so how do we do that and really what are the mechanisms? It's, it's really, there are multiple um, elements to this, but clearly from a financing point of view, all of the, the trends that we're seeing over these past five years, and I, guess I, I always say it's against all odds, you know, this has been a steep curve going up, but, you know, solar prices coming down have really proven that, you know, there's the economics case to it and that as we move away from fossil fuels and folks realize that it's not the, it's not going to be what's going to power our future. It brought us prosperity in the past, but it's the you know the the negative um, impacts from fossil fuels are really going to have the potential to undo the prosperity in the future for future generations. So you know the path forward really there are it's it's an all hands on deck. You know this is a real ambition. So anything that's going to be driving greater investment at scale is significant. And um, you know if it's clean energy then hope, you know, solar is going to be bringing those emission reductions because you're going to be displacing fossil fuels. It, but, but from a, a carbon or climate perspective, do you have in place ways of tracking the, the reduction impacts? Or is that something that still needs to be ironed out? Yeah, we don't do it specifically in terms of trapping, tracking impacts, but there are other um, organizations, you know, not-for-profits as well as governments that are, that are tracking that. Great. Um, and and, and we, if you think of some during the call, let me know, and otherwise we can pass that on to folks. But I do think this idea of being able to track the, the, the carbon reduction impacts are, are pretty important. Does anyone else want to chime in on that one before we go to another question from the audience? Um, well, the issue, I, I mean, the issue I think of, some of the companies are, are tracking that. Um, and, and I just wanted to point out that um, one way to measure how, how far we've come is if you look at, um, say, Tesla and Solar City, their market caps, the, the, the value that Wall Street and investors place on those two companies relative to some of the incumbents, like if you compare Tesla to GM and, say, Solar City to PG&E, one of the largest investor-owned utilities, um, you know, the, Tesla and Solar City have been around for less than 10 years or, or about yeah, 10 years in the case of Tesla, whereas PG&E and GM were, were formed in the 19, 1905 and 1907, something like that. So they've been around for 100 years, and, and yet the market caps of, um, of Tesla compared to, to GM are already, you know, it's over half the, the market right. cap. And, and Solar City is, you know, I don't know, 25 or 30 percent, uh, depending on, on the day, you know, is, is you know, you know, inching up on, on PG&E. And so this is really, to me, the, the lens to the future um, that, you know, we're in, in some ways we're passing that baton. Tim, did you want to add to that? Well, just the issue of, the issue of measurement is an important one. And as you noted in your introduction at the beginning, we, we've seen the, we're seeing the rapid expansion of the green bond sector. And and it, it is it is one thing when you have institutional investors who who are deal by deal have a team of people doing the due diligence and and where the money goes. As the market matures and then we expand out to into include everyone, um, it, it's really important there be transparency and that 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 we agree on the measures that are used to determine what's a green bond. What what really is um, going to offer offer benefit, and you're you're seeing you're seeing some efforts um, in that the the uh, a number of the major investment banks came together um, and and agreed on on how they were going to begin looking at this and measuring it, and and I think that there's more to be done um, for Solar City since since we're 100% solar, that's the only thing we do. Um, it's less of an issue for us, but I think, particularly in the project finance world, this will be a this will be a, a big issue and something that that we all need to pay attention to. 
Great. Uh, we're getting a lot of questions specifically about bonds, and I, I think in some cases, Tim, it might be about uh, solar city bonds. It may just be bonds in general. Um, uh, but let me just raise a question. The, the person states uh, debt capital can be great for developers, but a bond puts a retail investor in for the long haul. I'm not sure that's the case, but let's talk about that. What are the risks and how are we dealing with them? Can you talk a little bit about the, the risk profile of these types of bonds and, and how um, investors are, are positioned? And I think also address this thing about it, because I'm not sure they're in for the long haul. But can, can you talk a little bit about that, Tim? Well, it, 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 two things. One, it, it really depends on the, on the vehicle that you're investing in. If, if you're investing in, a, in, in an individual project that has a, the, that is a, uh, has a 20 year PPA that is, in, that is a utility scale um, wind project, for instance, um, uh, and you're, in, you're investing in that debt, um, and doing it as a, as a private transaction, you're in for the long haul, and you need to understand how that in, how that fits in your investment strategy. Um, at, at the other end of the scale, um, we're offering bonds with a, with a one year maturity. Exactly. And okay. and we in fact will um, you'll see us in the future offering some that are that maybe even may, maybe even offer more liquidity than that. Um, and uh, each of the vehicles, whether they be whether they be bonds or REITs or other things, um, offer different levels of liquidity, and and it really is important for investors to understand their own needs, and to to talk with their financial advisors or, or take a look at the as as is the case with any kind of investing, because different vehicles really do. In fact, the, the major difference in many of the vehicles is. The time frame over which you need to look at the investment. And and another question was, how are the solar bonds rated? Are you able to go into that briefly? Uh, sure. So our bonds are unrated in present, and the reason why is because they are they are corporate bonds, and Solar City is unrated. We're a relatively new company, as as Nancy's pointed out, and um, at, we have offered rated and investment grade rated. The, um, Bonds into the institutional markets, and that are based on the same underlying um, types of assets, our solar assets. Um, but when we wanted to expand and, and include individual investors, there really were uh, uh, some substantial regulatory barriers in moving from the kind of transaction that we that we did on the institutional side, which were private transactions. To a to a public transaction that's available to everyone, and so the decision we made was to go ahead and start with a with a with a corporate issued bond that's backed by Solar City. Got it. Um, that makes sense. It's currently unrated, and that will change as as uh, Solar City's rate changes. Gotcha. Um, so so another question: um, people are asking about fossil fuel divestment. Um, there's been a movement uh, for those on the the, the webinar don't know, you know, Stanford, the Rockefeller family, and others have been increasingly announcing various levels of fossil fuel divestment from their investment portfolio. Um, how does that impact the clean energy investment equation? Amy, is that something you're tracking? And Nancy, your thoughts on divestment overall? Uh, Amy, why don't we start with you? Amy, here, yeah, I'll just quickly just jump in on, you know, I, I do think the fossil fuel divestment um, campaign is only going to grow and accelerate. Um, it's moving much faster than other divestment campaigns have, and there's like a number of factors. I mean, we've got a, it's a student-run campaign, which is very helpful in terms of, you know, putting the, the issue of climate change on to, you know, this current generation for the future generation. An increased understanding, of course, about, you know, fossil fuels and the pollution, et cetera. Um, and clearly, as it was mentioned earlier, you know, how coal has already begun to go out of favor. Um, people are also concerned about stranded assets in the fossil fuel sector, too. So I think the push is, is just going to grow. I don't think it's easy, though. I mean, I think we're talking about the scale, again, of the investment in fossil fuel to be able to move out into clean energy. I think that's a challenge. And I'm sure Nancy deals with that regularly. <laughs> well, um, yeah, I'm 
I'm very um, optimistic about about this movement, and and it's really you know it's great to have demonstrations and marches and all of that, and and you know we we all support that. But what I'm really optimistic and and happy about is is that it's moving into the business schools, it's moving into the law schools. It's this movement. I just participated in a low carbon case competition at uh, the Yale School of Management last Friday that had um, students from all over the country. Um, doing a hypothetical how to advise a, a a university endowment to green their portfolio and you know it was that all of the submissions that they spent so much work on it uh, very professional you know things that a uh, an advisor to an endowment could could actually use and and they had more people apply than they could um, accept just in terms of the space they had so this is this is not just an emotional ideological Movement, although there's nothing wrong with that, obviously, it is it is um, really changing the way that finance and investing are are being taught, and so that we are really developing the tools to address climate change um, on the investment level. At the same time, that we're you know we're letting students um, you know have a reality to to their aspirational goal of bringing together. Uh, profession with with social change. Excellent. I, I, I want to go to technology for a second. I, we, we've talked a little bit about policy. We talked a lot about capital. Uh, let's talk about technology for a moment. Um, obviously, solar has been growing rapidly. We talked about the acquisition that just happened, and you know, obviously, wind has been uh, you know is the main cr contributor in the U.S. for clean energy solutions. Looking out over the next three to five years, again, I'm not giving any investment advice on this call, but, but looking out over the next three to five years, um, and we do have you, Nancy, so that's great. Which sectors do you think offer the best opportunities uh, for clean energy investors? What are the big uh, sort of uh, technology themes that you're looking at? And I'd like to start with you, Nancy. Sure. Uh, um, thank you. So if anyone's been listening to Lyndon on some of his recent speeches, uh, <laughs> there's a pretty pretty obvious clue as to where where an important field is. I mean, he he basically what did he say? You know, in by 2016 or 2017, I can't remember the year. You know, solar systems will be sold with storage systems. Right. So uh, you know, we got a lot of work to do to <laughs> make that happen. And and yet, what an opportunity! Uh, the and and you know, storage companies of all flavors have been toiling away and in stealth mode and kind of getting their chemistries right, etc. And now they're doing their demonstrations, and and people are beginning to see that this is not just something we're going to talk about forever. It, it's actually going to work, and that um, you know, instead of having to to firm renewables with with peakers or or gas plants, you know what? Storage, storage is a much cheaper, better solution. So storage is a is a huge opportunity that is is really just going, just coming out of um, kind of development mode. So I would really, especially as as people on the phone that are public market investors are, are paying attention to this, you know that's something to watch uh, for sure. And then uh, another another interesting facet of of renewable energy is is it's so much more water efficient than than fossil energy. The amount of water used in extraction technologies is, as we know, significant, and and there are there are issues related to that. Whereas renewable uh, energy has a much better water pro portfolio. So um, we we are looking very heavily at at water and energy, the the nexus of the two, and and there are going to be some terrific opportunities to improve efficiencies in water intensive industries and, and that are also often energy intensive. And one of those, of course, is is, is agriculture, which is is kind of one of the last huge markets in this country to have you know not thoroughly entered the um, you know the automated efficiency age. Great. Okay. So energy storage, automation, ag, some other stuff. Uh, Tim and Amy, let's get your viewpoints on this because I think everyone on the call is going to be interested. So Ron, I think I, I am. Um, uh, I think I would would not necessarily agree with the premise of the question, which is for the subject you're talking about this morning, which is which is clean energy retail investing. It's not about technology, um, and there will be fascinating work in different technology 
fields in different technology areas. But for, for retail investors, the opportunity now is really about scaling and participating in, in the, the, this expansion that is just now beginning that is our first real scaling of renewable energy. And the distributed solar is part of that um, solar combined with, with storage, as, as Nancy referred to, is going to be enormously disruptive. Um, but not because the technology has changed so much, it's because it, it, it enables us to scale across more states and, and more markets and provide more energy. But, but I think just, that, just so I understand, is that partly though sort of technology optimization and systems integration? Because I think a lot about sort of scaling is about better systems integration opportunity. Is, is, is that so, so it is it is it is technology in that sense. And so so Solar Cities has made um, I think now four acquisitions over the past year or so, and and all of those acquisitions have been have been um, other than the acquisition of my company, Common Asset have been essentially technology acquisitions that were aimed at reducing the cost of solar. And so, so for instance, the most recent acquisition that we made was Slevo, which was, right. which was advanced manufacturing technology for solar. And, 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 but even that was really about scale. It was about how do we provide, how, how do we ensure ourselves that we have a supply of, of solar panels to meet the demand that we see out there. And, and for that reason, we've taken that technology and have, have broken ground on what will be the largest manufacturing, solar manufacturing plant in the Western Hemisphere that, that we're building now in, in New York. And um, that gigawatt facility is really just, just likely the first down payment on an expansion of our manufacturing capacity. Again, it's a, it's a, it is technology, but it's really focused on scale. And, the, and, and you can't give investment advice um, but but I think it's a very interesting place to look, which is which is where are these technologies which have been in development for some time, um, with the support of, of Nancy and other other venture capitalists and others. But where are they really getting scale? Well, and I, no, I think it's a great point. It, it it removes a lot of the technology risk and it makes it be about deployment. And we've been talking about that for quite a while about you know. Projects, projects, projects. So, um, Amy, did you want to add anything on on sort of any sectors or technologies that you're watching? Yeah, I mean, I would really just ag agree that it is scale because we've got solar that needs to scale, electric vehicles need to scale, outdoor LED, LED lighting needs to scale, all the IT enabled energy efficiency needs to scale. So, technology that's here today that we really have to get out into market. Well, wait, 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 wait. I, I, as, a, <laughs> as a venture cap, I can't, I can't agree. I mean, obviously we need scale, but we also need to reduce costs. And the way you do that is both to scale manufacturing, but also to do it smarter and better. And, and they're just, I mean, we're having a hardware moment again. You know, mm. and we should be celebrating that, not saying it's, it's just about scale. I mean, the, the Zep Solar acquisition, you know, there, were, there was actually a lot of great engineering thought that went into figuring out how to do the bracketing and the rooftop connections faster, better, cheaper. You know, there, there are tracker technologies that are, you know, making solar uh, utility scale solar or larger solar farms more profitable because they're they're making trackers that follow the sun throughout the day. So you know this is what America's great at. So let's let's not um, I mean, let's I think we're we're kind of more agreeing more than disagreeing, but it's it's very important to fuel that innovation. Well, and I, I think it's a, and, it's a it's a it sounds like it's a both and. I yeah, totally agree. Yeah, I yeah. think the, I think the scaling fuels the innovation, right? Because with each step. You go through that, exactly. that virtuous cycle of the well, I appreciate that my question was on target. <laughs> so let, let's do this, guys. We're going to wrap up now. I, we, it's amazing. We, we got to the end. I, I want to, before everyone gets off, let me just a few things. We got a lot of uh, additional questions that we did not get to address. Um, a number of people were just asking about what is a yield co, what's a REIT. Um, there's a lot of information available on the web. I, I did write a column that's on our homepage right now. We can read my view on that. It gives a little bit of a definition on yield codes and REITs and also all these other mechanisms we've been talking about as well as examples. So, so please go there. And then finally, um, I know we stayed, we talked a little bit about uh, 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 politics and policy. Um, a lot of interest from the audience around the actions that states and cities can take and so maybe that's something we could continue in a future conversation 
a lot of questions around green banks and renewable energy standards and energy trusts and net metering. Oh. So uh, we don't have another hour. <laughs> we, we need another hour. So maybe we'll do it again um, with this gang. You guys are great. Uh, I, I want to thank everyone uh, for joining us today. Uh, I, I really want to thank Tim, Amy, and Nancy for their insights and, and really engaging in a lively conversation. And um, thank you all again, and we'll see you on future webinars. Great. Thanks, Thanks John. John. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.